Sisters Affair. My name is Gabrielle, and this is the podcast where we talk about women in history known for mayhem and murder. This week, I'm talking about Judy Moran. She is the matriarch of the Moran crime family in Australia. And that's right, this week we're talking about the mafia, and if I disappear after this episode, then it has been a pleasure talking murder with you all. Hopefully my possible death will be covered by Karen and Georgia on My Favorite Murder, and that's my final wish. So, y'all are in charge of making that happen. First things first, we gotta talk about our resources. So, a lot of these resources that I got were from articles covering the Moran crime family, and they were archived, so I had some PDF articles, and, um, you know, Wikipedia was involved, of course, but one of them was um, TheAge.com, which has a article about the Moran, t- Moran tapes that were released after the matriarch is found guilty. Um, there was an archived article from uh, the Herald Sun, and then there was NSMH.com, which had an article about Judy Warren possibly trying to sell her own biography. And then, of course, Wikipedia was helpful in talking about the Melbourne gangland killings, which we will talk about when I get further on in this episode. Now, before we get started on this week's episode, I wanted to take this to remind you guys that we have official podcast merch, which is amazing, and I'm super excited, and it's really, really comfortable. So if you guys haven't checked that out, then make sure you go to frumiusreads.com forward slash shop. And you can see the cool merch that we have there. One is a print with the logo design um, that says, I like my women with a little mayhem and murder. And then the other is the feminism quote that I love so much, which is feminism, women can be murderers too. So if you guys are interested in seeing what those look like, definitely check them out at fermiusreads.com forward slash shop. Now let's talk about Judy Moran. Judy Moran was born on December 18th, 1944. She grew up in Northcote with both her parents and married in 1963 to Leslie Johnny Cole. The marriage had a lot of issues right off the bat, and they were separated by 1966, which coincidentally was right around the time that she started seeing the prominent crime figure, Louis Moran. Soon after beginning this relationship, Judy legally changed her name to Judy Moran, And on November 10th, 1982, Judy's first husband, Leslie Cole, was murdered outside of his home. This, unfortunately for her, was the beginning of a series of deaths for those in her family. Before we get to those deaths, let's talk about the Moran crime family a little bit. So, the Moran family is an organized crime family based in Australia, where Lewis Moran, that's right, the Lewis Moran that our girl Judy was with, So, you know, she had high, high expectations there. Uh, He was the patriarch. It was involved in some pretty shady stuff, right? They are are primarily known for their role in something known as the Melbourne Gangland Killings, which was an underworld feud that was most active between 1998 and 2010. So that's a good, like, over a decade of just constant feuding. Now, obviously, there's a lot of background that led up to the Melbourne gangland killings, but since our episode is focusing on Judy and not on the entire history of Australia's infamous crime families, here's a brief summary. In 1966, John William Samuel Higgins was arrested. Now, he was the biggest meth dealer in Australia and was obviously really well-connected. The whole investigation was extremely shady, because of the amount of connection that this guy had. Not only to the criminal world, but with law enforcement too. It was one of the country's most expensive criminal investigations that finally led to a conviction. But one of the major drug busts that had been this huge drug cash that was linked to him and his whole operation mysteriously vanished from Melbourne's drug squad storage facility. So with his conviction came the beginnings of a power vacuum that the younger criminals became really, really eager to fill, which included Lewis and Judy's sons. The catalyst that really started this whole war was when prominent Melbourne gangsters Alphonse Gangitano and Charles Hegialigi, I am so sorry, it's Charles H-E-G-Y-A-L-J-I, Um, who's also known as Mad Charlie, were both murdered. Alphonse was killed in his home on January 16th, 1998, and Mad Charlie was killed outside of his home on November 23rd, 1998. It was suspected that Alphonse was killed by Jason Moran, who was the youngest son of the Moran family. Now, this led to an extreme power vacuum that many of their former associates rose to fill, only to then 
only to then be murdered themselves as other family and criminal syndicates tried to regain that power. In 1999, Jason and Mark Moran shot a man named Carl Williams, who led an opposing crime family in the stomach over a drug conflict. So Williams survived this and then began arranging for the murders of the entire Moran family as revenge, along with their associates. And he was apparently a man of his word. About a year later, Mark Moran was gunned down outside his home. In 2003, Judy's son, Jason Moran, was killed at a children's soccer game. In 2004, Louis Moran was gunned down at a place called the Brunswick Club. Williams was arrested and later found guilty for the deaths of Jason and Louis Moran. He was also under suspicion for Mark Moran's death and many others, and at the height of this whole gang rant, this whole gangland war, Judy Moran actually got into it with him outside of court. She accused him of murdering her entire family and just really went off on him, which honestly, I can't blame her for that. Williams eventually received 35 years to life for these murders, and after the court case closed, Judy Moran decided to publish her own autobiography about her life living as the matriarch of the Moran quote-unquote criminal dynasty. It was called Judith Moran, My Story, and was published with a huge amount of controversy to, I feel like, no one's surprise. I actually looked it up, and this book is available on Amazon for as low as $8.76, and I was really, really, really tempted to buy it. But here's my conundrum. This is a woman who was convicted for, spoilers, a murder conspiracy, whose entire livelihood came from this criminal empire that caused a lot of misery and pain for others. And so I don't know if I want to give money to this person or their estate. And I'm not sure if that's where the money would go if I bought it on Amazon. Like if I saw it at a library or at like a used bookstore or something where I know the proceeds wouldn't go directly to this person, then yeah, I'd probably buy it or at least borrow it from the library. But I always think it's really tricky when people who are convicted of these horrible, awful crimes publish quote unquote their story. Because obviously there's a huge interest in the why behind these crimes and what was happening in the person's head. And when said person publishes a book talking about their crimes and why they did it, or their reasoning behind them, it's hard not to be interested. But personally, I'm not someone who buys books from people who have been convicted of crimes that involve the murder slash harm slash irreparable damage done to other people. Just because I feel like that's a step too close to glorifying the crime or the criminal. But I definitely understand the temptation to pick up books because of that morbid curiosity. And I think buying it or borrowing it from places where the proceeds don't go directly to that person or their estate is different from buying it from a vendor that the person doesn't benefit from. But the subject all over can be kind of tricky. So I'd love to know your thoughts and feel free to reach out and let me know what they are. Judy Moran publishes this autobiography, which does deny a lot of the crimes attributed to her sons over the years. She also made some really negative comments about the former Victoria police detective Fred Sylvester, which actually led to a lot of places withdrawing several thousand copies of this book. After the book's release, Moran talked about wanting to buy a waterfront property and have a quieter and more anonymous lifestyle. Spoilers, that doesn't happen. One of the reasons this didn't happen is because she wasn't actually able to sell her house. And not only did it have a memorial to Alphonse Gangatino, but also potted plants that memorialized her murdered family members all over the property. Then we jump to March 2009. Judy's brother-in-law, Des Tuppence Moran, survived an assassination attempt when someone shot at the car that he and his driver, Mick Linsell, were in. There were no suspects and no arrests at this time. Then on June 15, 2009, Des Moran was killed in the middle of the day at a deli cafe in Melbourne. There were two gunmen that escaped in a getaway car driven by a third person. Judy was 64 at this time, and after she was notified, she was allowed to see the body of her brother-in-law at the murder scene. Which I get the need to identify the body and everything, but I'm really, really surprised they let her do it at the scene of his murder. I don't know. Maybe that's some kind of uh, protocol in Australia that I don't know about as an American. But when I read the story, I know that sounded really different and kind of weird to me. Okay, so. Dez's murder happened on a Monday, right? So by that night, Judy Moran and her daughter-in-law, Suzanne Kane, are in police custody. And oh, how quickly the mighty fall. 
So it turns out that the police had electronic surveillance on the Moran matriarch. Maybe something to do with the whole being extremely involved in the criminal underworld thing had something to do with it, but we'll never know. Um, on the surveillance, there was a recording of Judy and Suzanne talking to the at-this-time unknown murderer on the phone where they both told this person that they had gotten rid of the stuff. It doesn't really say what that stuff is here, but gotten rid of the stuff that had been used in the shooting. Judy Morin actually ends up arrested later that night because after having overheard the surveillance, they go to find her and find her coming back from after just hiding the car that matches the description of the car that was seen fleeing the murder scene. So after searching her house, the police find a hidden safe with three handguns, clothes that match the description of the men who shot her brother-in-law, a mask, a wig, and stolen registration plates. Later, uh, there is surveillance footage that's released of this search of the Moran home, and in it, it also shows that the safe was found hidden behind a bookshelf and that Judy was denying involvement in anything. By June 16th, which is literally the day after the murder, while Judy and Suzanne were being held in jail, a suspicious fire starts at Judy Moran's house that results in $150,000 in damage. On June 17th, bail is denied to the both of them because of their access to guns and their criminal connections. Eventually, two other men are also arrested in connection with Dez's murder. They are Michael Ferrugia and Jeffrey Armour. Apparently, this whole thing supposedly began as some sort of debt collection mission. That was according to Michael Ferrugia. He and Jeffrey Armour were driven to the cafe that Des Moran was at by Judy. Armour went inside, fired seven times into Des's body, and then the two men ran back to the car where Moran was awaiting as their escape route. When they came back, allegedly Judy congratulated them before telling them to take off their clothes and hand over the murder weapon so that she could get rid of it. It was also revealed in the trial that the attempt on Des Moran's life three months previously in March was also set up by Judy. Ferrugia agreed to testify against Judy and Armour and ended up getting four years in prison for manslaughter with a mandatory sentence of two years. Suzanne Kane was charged with being an accessory after the fact and given two years of suspended time. Armour pled guilty to murder and was sentenced to 26 years with a minimum of 21 served. And Judy Moran, who maintained her innocence until her sentence was read, was convicted of murder and conspiracy and sentenced to at least 26 years in prison. And that is the story of the Moran family crime matriarch, Judy Moran. I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. I would love to know what you think in the comments down below, or feel free to reach out to me. You can find me on social media like Twitter or Instagram or Tumblr or YouTube at Fermius Reads. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast to stay up to date with all of our new episodes. Wherever you listen to podcasts, we are available on Podbean, Libsyn, Apple Podcasts, and more if you search A Murderous Affair. Or you can go to the podcast homepage at frumiusreads.com forward slash a dash murderous dash affair. There you'll find all the new episodes as well as transcripts of these episodes. Don't forget to check out our merch shop, frumiusreads.com forward slash shop to get some cool new A Murderous Affair merch. But that's all I have for you today. Thank you so much for listening. Stay spooky, friends, and I'll talk to you next week. Goodbye.